These are the nine rarest abilities in One Piece. These are powers so unique that they have nothing to do with devil fruits, nothing to do with Haki, and each ability can only be used by a single individual within the One Piece world. So we One Piece fans often make a big fuss about devil fruit awakenings and how rare they are, when realistically, they are far too common to be included in a video of rare abilities. So as Conqueror's Haki and even the voice of all things, three people use that, that's too many, that's not rare. This world isn't governed by one or two broad power systems, and if you dig deeply enough, you'll find that each and every individual is capable of crafting something borderline magical. Like say Miss Golden Week and her Colors Traps power. This is an ability so strange and frankly unexplainable that it often gets mistaken for a devil fruit power. Which is that through the sheer force of art, Miss Golden Week is able to influence people's emotions, actions, and even whole personalities with shocking ease. The first use of which was when Luffy stepped into Miss Golden Week's Black of Betrayal which made him not want to save his friends who were about to die imminently. But she can make you feel or do literally anything. Send you into fits of laughter, soothe you into an indifferent pacifism, or even make you infuriate to the point where she can force you to fight. All through the painfully simple application of paint on a target. And to the best of our knowledge, the paint itself contains no special properties. There's nothing magical or technologically advanced about it. Really, like most great works of art, it's all about how the artist wields the paint to conjure an emotion in those viewing the work, or in this case, I suppose, experiencing the work. It's almost inconceivable that this isn't a devil fruit ability. And this could be like a Kinemon kind of situation where Miss Golden Week has accidentally eaten a devil fruit without knowing it and just believes that this power is natural. But the author of One Piece, Etra Oda, did confirm in the SBS of volume 23 that this is not the case and that Miss Golden Week's skills can more accurately be described as a form of hypnosis. And it's also implied that those of particularly strong minds would be immune, or if if not immune, at least less affected by the colors traps. Which is why it was particularly devastating to have this ability used on the less than mentally sound Monkey D. Luffy. Although to Luffy's credit, he has the strongest willpower of probably anyone in One Piece. So if colors traps work on him, then I see no reason why it wouldn't affect any emperor of the sea or even a pirate king. Especially since one emperor already has a very similar ability that he uses on himself. Emperor of the sea Kaido is able to access an exclusive suite of abilities known as Shuron Hake, which I'd like to emphasize has nothing to do with his devil fruit or Haki. So the literal translation of Shuron Hake is Sake Dragon Eight Trigrams, which is why we stick to Shuron Hake because that's not particularly helpful. But this is Kaido's take on the drunken fist style of martial arts where he becomes heavily intoxicated and is able to rapidly switch between eight different forms according to whatever arbitrary mood swings he's having at the time. So because the title says eight trigrams, I would assume that Kaido has eight forms However, in reality, we've only seen seven. For the sake of simplicity, we have depressed Kaido, crying Kaido, rage Kaido, drunken beggar Kaido, drunken thief Kaido, bloodthirsty drunk Kaido, and happy Kaido. That last one there is actually very similar to Luffy's form in Gear 5th. Kaido physically cannot stop laughing and acts in a very cartoonish way. Now you might notice that some of these forms sound a little bit more threatening than the others, which is very much the key to this ability. Half of the modes are designed to put the opponent off guard while still maintaining a strong defense, with the other half of them being highly deadly specialty switches. In the manga, it was like Luffy was fighting seven different opponents at once, all tagging in and out between each other. Luffy had so much difficulty keeping up with Kaido's mood swings, which gave Kaido the opportunity to get some key damage in. Now, the obvious disadvantage of this ability is that Kaido himself cannot control it. He gets drunk and then the fight becomes a glorified game of roulette, but it does make him stronger. These forms actively increase his haki. And my theory as to why is because it brings out Kaido's most powerful emotions and with emotions comes willpower. So what we have are Kaido's peak emotions and his peak willpower surfacing. These moods do also interact with Kaido's Zoan fruit and morph him physically in some cases into bizarre hybrid forms that are inaccessible to him while sober. And I do think it's sad that we never got to see this Kaido go up against Gear 5th Luffy because that would have been pure insanity. Also, this video is sponsored by BetterHelp, a platform designed to connect you with a licensed therapist, trained to listen and provide you with helpful unbiased advice. Because Starting therapy is difficult, and finding the right therapist, mate, that, that can be particularly difficult, especially if they're not in your area or they're booked up months in advance. But BetterHelp can match you to one of over 30,000 therapists in their network, with sessions available, phone calls, live chats, messaging, whatever works best for you at whatever time is most convenient for you. Which I like, because I'm a big fan of convenience. And as a pretty profound introvert, I'm also not a huge fan of face-to-face -face interactions. So this is very much a win-win for me, as well as a win for the over 4 million 
helping people who have already used BetterHelp to start healthy, happier lives. And you can do the same through my link in the description. To get started, you just need to fill out a questionnaire describing your specific needs, and in most cases, you'll be matched with your therapist within 48 hours. And if the therapist you're matched with doesn't quite feel like the right fit, which is quite common when starting therapy, it's not a problem, but in that case, you can easily switch to a new one at no additional cost, and no stressing about networks and insurance and any of the all of the things. So if you think you might benefit from therapy, then consider BetterHelp. And if you visit through my link in the description, then you will get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. Thanks so much again to BetterHelp for helping to support this channel. So give BetterHelp a go and see if it's the right fit for you. But for now, it's back to you, me. But the next ability might be one of the most unique powers, not just in One Piece, but in manga in general, and it's Lao Ji's Jioken. Which, because it's Lao Ji, you always have to put a sharp emphasis on the G part of Jioken. And it's a very bizarre form of combat designed for the geriatric physique. And what I mean by that is that this is an ability you learn and train for as a youthful person in preparation to wield it during your old age. To be clear, there are no benefits of using Geoken when you're young, because it allows Lao Ji to store and conserve his muscle power during his youth in order to wield it once his body has withered and aged. It's like the combat equivalent of saving for retirement. Every combat paycheck, you put some of that combat power away. Ideally, it then compounds with some sort of combat interest rate. And then eventually, over time, it becomes a big nest egg and you are set to live to death. My personal favorite Geoken technique is actually called battle insurance, where Lao Ji withdraws large quantities of power that he'd saved up in his youth, should he come across a particularly dire situation. And also Geoken gives him a sort of enhanced control over the concept of his own existence in general. There's one point during the Dress Rose Rock where Lao Ji actually dies mid fight against Sai, but he's able to become consciously aware of his death in soul form and return to his body, which is played as a gag in the manga, but like the dude still did it. And it's not an unprecedented power either. Brooke can do the same thing just via magical fruit. But I love the concept of Jioken because it means that Lao Ji was a man who was born to be old. His whole youth was about the pursuit of being elderly. And it's a fun quirky power that I wish we could see in a few more One Piece characters. Lao Ji of course appears during the Dress Rose Rock, which is something of a gold mine for these super rare unique powers. Because the setup is that Doflamingo was holding a tournament in the Corridor Coliseum with Ace's former devil fruit being offered as a prize. So it attracts people from all over the world to compete for it. But most importantly, because the prize is a devil fruit, it primarily attracts people who are not already devil fruit users, which is why we get this amazing showcase of niche abilities that normally wouldn't pop up, such as the always forgotten Jiao Kun Do used by Blue Gilly, which is quite a trippy power because it involves Blue Gilly moving his legs so quickly that they create after images and make it nigh on impossible to predict where the actual attack is going to land. This probably sounds pretty simple compared to a lot of the stuff we have examined and some stuff we are going to examine. But this kind of speed, it's out of this world. Even with the insanely swift characters like Kizaru or Sanji, we've not seen anything on the level of what Blue Gilly demonstrated here, and it is arguably the single greatest demonstration of combat speed in the series currently. And the only reason why we don't know exactly how effective the ability is happens to be because of another stupidly rare power used by one person in the Corridor Coliseum, by which I'm referring to Elisabello II's King Punch, which is one of the most mind-boggling mystery powers in the world. Dagama the Tactician describes his power as follows. My King Elisabella II was born with a living weapon of mass destruction. The punches he unleashes from his powerful physique are astonishing to behold. He left the world speechless when he smashed through the fortress of an enemy with one blow. There's just one drawback to his power. In order to throw a single punch, he requires a full hour of heavy concentration and warming up. It's his treasured heirloom, a weapon that can only be unleashed once in any battle. The King Punch, a weapon devastating enough to sink one of the four emperors should it land squarely. So an attack powerful enough to take down an emperor under the right conditions. Those are some pretty big words. And it's always worth questioning how much of a reliable narrator Dagama is. But at the very least, this is an attack on par with what the four emperors are capable of conjuring. Because when Elisabello II unleashed King Punch, it was one of the single most powerful attacks we'd ever seen and still have ever seen to this day, actually. It's quite comparable to something like Kaido's Borrow Breath. The main difference being that Kaido can use Borrow Breath seemingly infinitely, whereas Elisabello is restricted to one King Punch per battle. But even then, to have access to the power of an Emperor when you're this random King dude with no Devil Fruit and no Haki is almost more impressive. Borrow Breath was given to Kaido as part of his Devil Fruit, but with Elisabello, this is just pure concentrated focus strength and very mysteriously a power that no one can replicate. An ability that Elisabello was born with and I can't imagine that discovering this ability for the first time went particularly well for anyone.
one. It sounds like a very messy and destructive childhood. It's definitely not the messiest raw power though. That title most certainly belongs to Wanzi, who wields the hilarious but kind of gross ramen kempo ability. Sometimes powers are rare because you need to be born with them, like say King Elizabella, but sometimes powers are rare simply because, well, absolutely no one else wants to use them. Ramen kempo involves Wanzi wielding absolutely gigantic, pretty prepared ramen noodles in an assortment of combative techniques, which Wanzi tends to call spanks, and he's even able to pilot a suit of noodle armor, which Wanzi describes as an edible combat uniform, everyone's dream weapon. And shockingly enough, this ability isn't just a joke. And it is implied by Wanzi that this is a special power that only he has access to, or only he wants to have access to. As in, in order to study ramen kempo as a martial art, you need to learn the special ingredient, which is being able to control the ramen noodles at will. It's almost like what CP9's Kumadori does with manipulating his hair, although that is an application of Seimeki Khan, which is an ability that wasn't rare enough for this video because two people use it, Kumadori and Rob Lucci. But ramen kempo is quite similar, just with noodles. The key difference is that Seimeki Khan is all about controlling your body and your life force. That's why Kumadori can do stuff like expertly manipulate his hair into hands. But with Wanzi, it appears that he has discovered a genuine method to manipulate whatever force or substance lies within those super chunky noodles. If you think about it purely from an academic standpoint, it's very impressive. But if you go further than that, and remember that Wanzi once used this to shoot noodles out of his nose under the guise of an attack called Ramen Beam, then it does lose its academic credibility somewhat. When it comes down to it, I think that if someone really wanted to for some reason, then they could figure out the secret of noodle manipulation and wield Ramen Kempo. But no one wants to, and that's why this ability is unique to Wanzi and Wanzi alone. However, just as a bit of a Wanzi status update, after his defeat on the sea train, he started dating a lovely woman who he is seen proposing to in One Piece film Gold. So good on him. And it should serve as encouragement to all of you. If the guy who shoots noodles through his nose can put in the effort and get the girl of his dreams, then so can you. Maybe. I don't guarantee that actually. Especially if you're dreaming of Nami because she's fictional, but to her fictional credit, she has access to a power that no one else could even dream of, being the art of weather. So this is probably the most complicated ability in this video because it goes through a series of different iterations as One Piece goes on. But essentially, Nami is able to create and manipulate the weather around her due to a device known as the Climate Tact, the latest version of which is a fusion product of Nami's knowledge combined with Usopp and Frankie's engineering. So it took three geniuses from different fields to come together and give birth to this, this weather stick. And even then, not just anyone can use it. The reason why this ability is unique to Nami is because you need her mental encyclopedia of global weather to even begin your journey in mastering the art of weather. So the Climate Tact Nami currently wields is called the Sorcery Climate Tact because we've reached the point where a lot of what she does is just indistinguishable from elemental magic. And what also helps is that it's inhabited by Zeus, a piece of soul cloud that significantly amps up the damage capabilities of the Climate Tact when it comes to lightning-based attacks. And you know, we did credit Elisabello for having an emperor level attack and we're going to give the same credit to Nami because with Zeus, Nami can conjure lightning blasts on the same scale as that of the Emperor Big Mom, which very much makes her one of the most heavy hitting straw hats judging by single attacks alone. But this miracle fusion of science, engineering and anthropomorphic cloud friend can only exist in the hands of Nami. For our next rarest ability, it's difficult to classify whether this is a nice hidden power or a heavily detrimental hidden curse. Going back to Dress Rosa, we need to address the existence that is Cavendish, a lovely boy who harbors a dark split persona known as Harkaba, who emerges as a combination of three conditions held by Cavendish, being narcolepsy, sleepwalking, and dissociative identity disorder. His narcolepsy allows his other identity, Harkaba, to come out, and his sleepwalking allows Harkaba to move. Although I think that just labeling it as sleepwalking very much undersells what's going on here. When Harkaba is out, Cavendish's face physically changes color and his combat abilities skyrocket, particularly in the areas of speed and precision, which combined with Harkaba's innately bloodthirsty nature means that Cavendish has to be very careful because if he falls asleep in the wrong place, then Harkaba is going to go on a bit of a slicing spree. So there's a tale of one of Harkaba's incidents from the Rommel Kingdom. Apparently his attacks were so swift that the people thought that they were being cut down by the wind because they just couldn't see what was obliterating all of them, which earned Harkaba 
Hakuba the epithet of Kamaitachi of Rommel, which literally means the sickle weasel of Rommel, which I'm not sure quite captures the nigh on demonic nature of Hakuba. Although to the anime's credit, this information was revealed in episode 666, and that was nice and thematic. And this is one of the many incidences that brings up the vague idea of demons within One Piece. They don't get addressed very often, but there are these incidents every now and then that we simply cannot ignore. Another example of a Hakuba-like state is whenever Charlotte Lin Lin gets thrown into a hunger tantrum and becomes this demonic entity that isn't too dissimilar from Hakuba at all. And it's very possible that there's a presence living within both of them. And they're not the only ones either, because the straw hat swordsman Rowan Ozoro, often referred to as a demon and now the self-professed king of hell, is the user of another unique ability known as Ashura. Zoro is the main protagonist who we've been following ever since chapter three. And Ashura is a technique we've known about since chapter 417, which was published 18 years ago now and we still have no understanding of exactly what this is. Ashura involves Zoro accessing nine sword style, where Zoro appears to grow four extra arms and two extra heads, bringing his sword total to a mighty nine. And the biggest mystery has always been, is Zoro physically manifesting all of these extra bits? Or is it just an illusion he's conjuring? But no matter what the answer is, it doesn't prevent the next question, which is how. During the raid on Onigashima, Kaido revealed that Zoro has Conqueror's Haki, and that's how he was able to injure him, which appeared to imply that Ashura was the result of said Haki. But at the same time, that would mean that Zoro has been using Conqueror's Haki ever since any slobby. And as much as my Zoro fanboy heart is well and truly prepared to embrace that, it just doesn't feel like quite the right answer. Especially since no other character in the series has ever used Conqueror's Haki in a way that even comes close to this. Conqueror's Haki tends to have a very uniform effect, and Zoro here would be getting a detention because he's arrived at Conqueror's Haki school out of uniform. So one idea is that Ashura and Nine Sword style is granted to Zoro through the cursed Kitetsu blade he wields, whilst another is that he could be harboring and accessing demonic powers in the same vein as Big Mom and Cavendish. All I know is that we've been waiting for the answer to this mystery for 18 years, and I still don't expect it to be solved anytime soon. But if you want to be the first to find out, then don't forget to subscribe to this channel for consistent injections of One Piece culture administered directly into your YouTube feed.